Crime scenes are always unique and filled with surprises. This one was remarkably so. I have never seen human eyeballs used as a weapon to cause death before or since. That was the only time. Someone attacks this victim, gouges out his eyes, and stuffs them in his mouth. The ultimate expression of rage. It turns out a young woman becomes the killer in this event, something that's pretty unusual. You should watch this and find out how that happened. I was doing my normal morning routine. And I'm making coffee, because coffee is the fluid that makes the police department run. Dispatch informs Kenda there's an apparent homicide on the 2200 block of East Bijou Street. I'm on the way. The most incredible thing about the press is the standard first question. And here he comes now. Detective, do you have any suspects? Yes, I do. I have 600,000 of them, including you. That tended to stop the questioning for a period of time until I could find out what was happening. So what do we got? There was no identification on him. They, they had no idea who this male was. There was a woman with him, however, if you want to talk to her, right over here in the back of the car. Excuse me, ma'am. Can you step out of the car, please? She says, my name is Grace Todd. When she gets better, then we're going to have a long and serious heart to her. But I have time before that can even take place. So I'm going to look at other things. Our victim is thin. He is elderly. How old is he? Hard to say. He has blood on the front of his clothing and blood on his face. The orbits around the eyes just looks odd to me. And I turned to one of my guys and I said, look at his eyes. They don't look right. So I'm wearing a pair of rubber gloves. And I pushed open his right eye. The eyeball isn't there. I open the other eye. That eyeball isn't there either. They've been removed. Good God. I can't believe that the eyeballs are gone. But the empty eye sockets aren't the only horrifying clue. I look at his mouth, and it doesn't look right either. His lips are kind of protruding slightly. So I pull his lower lip back. Holy <laughs> You see that? There's an eyeball in his mouth, and it's looking at me. Oh, hello. It's disgusting, it's revolting, it's scary, it is bizarre, it is holy smokes kind of thing. It's everything all at once. This eye looking at me from inside this guy's mouth was almost enough to push me over the edge. Case workers at the detox center identify the victim as one Vern Roger Cave. With his victim positively ID'd, Kenda orders his team to canvas the area for witnesses. All right, guys, you know the drill. Let's go knock on these businesses' doors, see if anyone saw anything. Now that piques my interest. Now he rises up on the radar as somebody we need to find right away. Lieutenant Joe Kenda believes the gruesome murder of 60-year-old Vern Cave was personal. What we're looking for right now is relationships. So we begin with the immediate area where he lives. Gary, you want a pickup truck? Oh, absolutely. Usually parks in the same place. Let me show you where it is. Sure. It's that truck right there. The one with the cap on it? Yeah, that's it. It has a camper shell on it. Well, my, my, my. Yeah. 
I'm Joe Kent from the Colorado Springs Police Department. He's a cleanser whistle. Can I come in and talk to you for a minute? There's no blood. Drunk, yes. Disheveled, of course. But no blood. Another point in his favor. Vern was murdered last night. Oh, man. He had no idea Vern was dead. And for the present moment, he's off my list. I don't think he's involved. I don't. With Gary Todd in the clear, Kenda is out of leads. Then he gets a call. I've got a key witness I think you should speak to. They didn't say good witness. They didn't say potential good witness. They said key witness. That really boosts my morale. 10 for him on the way. It's fine. Are you expecting something? No, no. Who is that? I don't know. This woman is screaming, pretty much, open the door, I need your phone, I need to borrow the phone. I don't have a phone. And then she said, I just killed somebody. Bingo. The magic lead. He is the key with us. And he just unlocked my case. I want to know the truth. And she appears to be my best source. Hi, Grace. I'm Joe Kenda. Hi. You realize we're here because Vern Cave is dead? I didn't do it. Grace, you're under arrest for the murder of Vern Roger Cave. You have the right to remain. No! No! <laughs> Just... <sighs> okay, I... I... said, okay, I poked his eyes out because he tried to get in my pants. He kept touching me, was putting his hands on my thighs. If you touch me again, I'm going to kill you. Stop. Burn. <laughs> Just stop! She dives at him. Do not even touch him! Attacks him, takes her thumb and index finger, and pulls the eyes out of his head. And it's like, wow. Grace Todd pleads guilty to second-degree murder and is sentenced to 16 years in the Colorado Department of Corrections. Hey, Doc. Hey, Lieutenant. Do we have cause of death yet? Yes, I have. But you're not going to believe it. Man choked on his own eyeball. This case was terribly tragic. A mother and four little kids dead at the hands of a landlord. When I take this investigation over, the discovery of what actually did happen is even more bizarre. And it takes a complicated turn of events and a chain of events to lead to the identity of the person who's actually responsible for killing a woman and four little kids. It is a incredibly complicated tale but one I think you'll find to be remarkably interesting. Lieutenant Joe Kenda is heading back to the station when an urgent call comes in. Who it was was a frantic police dispatcher spitting out information about a multiple death going on at 503 South Hancock, followed by, get here, get here right now, on my way. Minutes later, Kenda pulls up at the scene. The house is swarming with both law enforcement and local media. That's a big deal, particularly on a Sunday afternoon. There's something really wrong here. They're all dead. And I'm thinking, oh, God, not that. Stepping through the doorway, Kenda takes note of an odor he's come to know all too well. It's the smell of death. You never forget that smell. That odor is unique, and it's overwhelming. Kenda starts his investigation by examining the dead woman. The children are ages 9, 11, 13, and 15. Their fingernails are turning black. These people have been dead for three or four days. Suddenly, Kenda is struck by a strange sensation. 
the feeling that he's going to be sick. It overcame me. Disorientation of the thought process, abdominal cramps that get more and more severe. I felt terrible. I know what killed these people, and it's still present in this building. We gotta get out of here. What? Now, we gotta get out of here. I said, let's get out of here right now. Get out. Wow, I'm already getting a hit. This is absolutely fatal level of carbon monoxide. Absolutely fatal. Here's the problem. That's the hit exchange. It's put in backwards. It was pouring out 2,300 parts per million. It could kill you instantly. He says it's designed to only go in one way to prevent you from putting it in backwards. But someone hammered this in here. Whoever did this had absolutely no idea what they were doing. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, or they did know. The two guys know about each other and they don't like each other. Ooh, not only we have suspects, we have two of them. When Kenda starts asking about Sophie's murder, Nathan softens up fast. He started crying. He also admits that, I, I love Sophie. I feel so bad that she's dead. Nathan was generally distraught. Emotion drives murder. Money, sex, or revenge. There's no money here, but there's sex, and maybe there's revenge. Nathan is no longer a suspect, but I certainly know who is. Got some bad news for you. What's up? The girl Sophie you've been dating? Yeah. She and her three kids have all passed away. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. Like his romantic rival, Nathan Joyce, Kevin Cusick seems genuinely distraught. He's very straightforward. He does have a motive, and he has opportunity. But is he the guy? I don't feel it. I just don't feel it well. So I let him go. Go away. I'll be back in touch with you if I need to be. Brenda? I woke up with a headache. But the only thing I remember is I was probably the sickest I have ever been. They told me that I had gotten sick from carbon monoxide. According to Marvin, there can only be one culprit, his former landlord, Daryl Atkinson. Marvin says, I called him and I told him that appliance was bad. Atkinson says to him, this furnace is no good. It's old. I need to fix it. I'm no longer in a quandary about who my man is. It's a 72-year-old landlord. I'm prepared now to arrest him. How? What do you mean? I said, Daryl, let me tell you what I think you did. I think you went and got a part, a heat exchanger, for that old furnace. And then you put it in yourself because you were going to save the money. You had no idea what you were doing. None whatsoever. Suspicious death, possible code nine. Cop talk for murder. What's the address? Kenda makes an alarming connection. Is that Daryl Atkinson's residence? 404 East Caramel Street. That's where Atkinson lives. There he sits behind the wheel, pink and white, just like Sophie and her kids. He killed himself in the same way he killed that family. Carbon monoxide poisoning. I think the person who realized better than anyone how senseless and horrible it was was Daryl Atkinson. It was essentially a self-imposed death penalty.
This case was particularly sad because of the victims attacked by a boy and girl in a robbery who steal a grand sum of $31. They kill Sam, the 83-year-old. They believe they kill Rosa, the 79-year-old, but she survives. I built armor around my heart to survive emotionally dealing with people in these circumstances. But Rosa went through it like a stiletto in that interview. And it pains me to remember it to this day. I found who hurt her, Sam, and I buried him under a prison where he still is. Any little mistake. Lieutenant I'm Joe Kenda is breaking in his new detective, Louis Velez. Go ahead for Kenda. When we arrived, their place are surrounding the Rio Grande grocery. The press is setting up. A large group of neighbors are out. Detective. How you doing? OK, tell about the victims. Sam Malena and his wife, Rosa. They operate this business they have for 40 or 50 years. The victims were still there but they were being treated and they were being moved by one of the ambulance companies. I see a telephone on the counter. It's interesting because the cord to this phone goes all the way into the residence of where Sam and Rosa live. Can I use your phone? Sure. Go ahead for Kenda. I get a call from the hospital. Sam Malena is dead from his wounds. So it's confirmed homicide. It's condition of Rosa, critical but stable. Instead of the usual clamor that's going on in crime scenes, this is like a church and they're all looking at us. And I know what they're thinking. What are you gonna do about this? Watch me and you're gonna find out what I'm gonna do. Kenda is desperate to speak with the crime's sole survivor, me, sir. Rosa Malena. Though critically injured, she's finally able to speak. Her right eye is swollen shut, and there is a bruise running down her face. And when you look at it closely, you see the pattern of a sole of a shoe. Somebody jumped on her face. I don't want to do her harm. So I said, okay, Rosa, thank you so much. And she looks at me and she says, what about my Sam? Excuse me. I said, Rosa, we'll find who hurt your Sam. We'll find him. Yes, sir. We give him the description. Mr. Brayden. Do you recognize or think you've ever seen the following two people in the neighborhood? Well, it sounds like the couple have just moved in downstairs. Downstairs here? Yeah. Oh, now we're cooking. Everybody calls him Larry. How about the girl? Uh, I think her name's Vivian. She's got real frizzy red hair. Wow. All of a sudden, it appears in front of you. The critical piece. Please, let me see your hands! Found us in the bedroom. Lawrence Eugene Todd, Vicki Lynn Lachlan. Uh, Lieutenant, I think I've got one for you. This is Lieutenant Kanda.
we're close, but we're not close enough. And it's just making me crazy. Where are these sons of bitches? And why can't we find them? Hey, uh, where are you going? I said I was going to Price, but they said, well, we're going to California. I said, well, I'd take you as far as Green River. They said that would be fine. The young couple seems friendly enough, but Dale Lang immediately notices something odd about them. They didn't have any luggage, no backpacks, nothing. Just them. Hey, do you have any passengers with you? Uh, yes, I have a, a man and a woman. And I said, I picked him up and hitchhiking just on the other side of the border in Colorado. He said, well, they're wanted in Colorado Springs for homicide. I said, what? Tell me what happened. We were poor. As he was leaving, Lawrence went and grabbed him around the neck and started strangling him. Stabbed him in the chest. What are you doing? He grabbed her and around the neck started choking her. And then he jumped on her head. He said he wanted to break her neck. He grabbed the money and he ran out the back door. That was the end of that conversation. Didn't take very long. I look at his personal property to include his shoes or a pair of sneakers. I turn those sneakers over, and the bruise on Rosa's face is a perfect match to Lawrence Todd's shoes. Vicki Lynn Lachlan was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Lawrence Todd was found guilty. He was sentenced altogether to life plus 98 years, ensuring that he would never be released from custody. That case made me crazy, and I have never forgotten it.